strength is gone. You're the one who calls me on. You are the life. You are the fight that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. Welcome to Drama Kirk's Bible Study Evening, where we use drama techniques to explore scripture together. To those of you who have joined us for these evenings before, welcome back. It's wonderful to have your fellowship again. For any new friends, I'm Liz Blackman and I lead Drama Kirk. Now this is the first time obviously that we've tried one of these study evenings online. We really look forward to the opportunity to get together in person. But meantime, while we're unable to, it is still a great pleasure to share in fellowship and in scripture together. I want to extend my thanks, first of all, to everybody who has been involved, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes, in putting this together for you tonight. Now, if you happen to be watching this live, which is 7pm on the 19th of May, you can use the chat facility on YouTube to make any comments about what you're experiencing and seeing and also to ask any questions. We would absolutely love it if you did that. Please make the most of this and let's make this an interactive experience together. So tonight is the second in a series called Calling the Disciples where we've been looking at those first called to follow Jesus and what that has meant for them. Now you don't need to have joined us last time to be up to speed because I'm going to bring you up to speed. So last time we looked at the first callings, the two sets of brothers, Andrew, Peter, James and John. And tonight we begin to answer that question, okay, he's got four disciples, so what next? So join with us as we explore that very question together. I'm going to read now a wee theme text for the evening. And it's taken from John chapter 15, verse 9. John 15, verse 9. Now, I am reading from the Passion Translation. As we hear this, can we please hear the absolute certainty of Jesus' love for the disciples? But let's also extend that and hear it as absolute certainty of his love for us too. I love each of you with the same love that the Father loves me. You must continually let my love nourish your hearts. Our opening prayer. 
We come before you, our God of the passion, our God of continual love. We ask humbly for your presence here with us tonight in our homes and in our church. We ask that you would nourish our hearts and nourish us as we continue to serve you and draw us ever closer to you through what we share this night. The honour, praise and glory be yours. Amen. Now, these have tended to be relaxed and informal nights where we've had a bit of a laugh together as we've embodied those characters in scripture and we've drawn closer to them. Obviously tonight the format will be a little different and I have called upon the Drama Kirk team to improvise and read certain bits and then we will pull that all together into something which hopefully extends your understanding of what those characters might have been feeling or experiencing. So we have three exercises planned tonight. The first is a wee flight of fancy that I'm calling the Gospel Gossips. The second is a bibliodrama exercise where we really think into a text and, and think about what those characters were feeling and experiencing. And then finally, um, we will improvise scripture. So, the gospel gossips then, our first exercise for tonight. Now, we talked briefly last time about what the disciples must have left behind. I don't know about um, any women listening or watching tonight but I, I certainly can't picture that happening in my household and, and not talking about it. So while we don't hear very much in scripture for, for the response from the women, I thought it would be nice to explore what that might be together. So with my thanks to Capernaum Street which is put together by Potted Jam and also to The Word of the Wives written by Abby Guinness, I'm going to ask now some members of the Drama Kirk team to take you through some imaginings of what the response back at home might have been to the disciples when they decide to follow Jesus. Over to them. I'm going with Jesus. You're doing what? We're going to follow him wherever he goes. He's from God, you know, Liz. I don't care where he's from, you're not going. But I have to. Please try to understand. I'll come back and see you. And what about me and the kids here all on our own? Your mum will be here. Yes, but what am I going to tell that Martha next door? Ooh, my husband's got religion and he's off following some nutcase around the countryside. You said he was a very nice man. I thought he was until this. Listen, I've, I've got to go now. I'll come back and see you. Oh, no. How am I going to manage with no income and seven kids and my sickly mother to feed? What am I going to do? James and John were always a handful. A pair of tearaways, always in trouble. Their father and I often wondered if they would ever amount to anything. Until the day that they all went fishing together. But Zeb came home alone and said a rabbi had handpicked them to be his disciples. <laughs> I laughed in his face. My two boys don't have the education to train with a rabbi. Jesus said they're going to be fishing for people, Zeb said. <laughs> Whatever that meant, I thought. Sons of thunder. That's what Jesus calls them. He does like to tease. And he has channeled all that thunder into pure sunshine. Am I proud? Beaming. I remember the day Jesus told them he was heading back to Judea to heal Lazarus. We all tried to dissuade him. It would be too late anyway. And the authorities were out to get him. It was madness to put himself at risk. And we all told him so. Except my Tom, who pipes up. Let's all go and we can die with him. 
awkward silence. Jesus just smiled and squeezed his shoulder. But I pulled him aside and said, Oh, thanks a lot, Tom. What about me and the kids? What, what will we do if you go and get yourself killed? Oh, he says. And his big face just fell. Oh, I, I never thought. It's just, I think I'd rather die with him than live without him. I held my tongue and just put my arms around him instead. I don't think there'd be many wives that understanding. <laughs> Had you ever thought of those men following Jesus from the perspective of the families they left behind? Interesting reflections and a bit of fun too. And my thanks to everybody involved. If you do have any observations or questions around what we've just shared, please do use the YouTube chat to be able to share those with us. They're very welcome indeed. And I can assure you that as someone who has gone through the modern day equivalent of their husband coming home from work to say that they're away to follow Jesus, I have said much worse than these wives. So thank you for that, everyone involved. And I hope that has enriched your understanding of the calling of those fishermen. We move now to our bibliodrama exercise. For those unfamiliar with the practice of bibliodrama, it originated in continental Europe. And it really seeks that deeper engagement with scripture through really experiencing the emotions that the characters involved experience too. So, so that for me is the clear link with Drama Kirk as we try to embody this, the characters in scripture to help us unlock a wee bit more of their experience. So I'm going to read a passage of scripture to you now from slightly further on in that chapter of John that we read from earlier. What I would like you to do is use your imagination to really think and feel yourself into the text. You can close your eyes if that would help you to experience that more deeply. I'd like you to notice the very strong words that Jesus chooses here to express himself. And I would like you to picture yourself as one of his disciples sitting at his feet, hearing these words. How would you have felt? What would you have experienced? So again, from the Passion Translation, John chapter 15, 16 and 17. You didn't choose me, but I've chosen and commissioned you to go into the world to bear fruit. And your fruit will last. Because whatever you ask of the Father for my sake... He will give it to you. So this is my parting command. Love one another deeply. So I hope you noticed those very direct words of our Lord. And I hope you really took that opportunity to think into the scenario. Did you see yourself sitting amongst the sandals? Did you hear those words? Did you think about what he's asking and how did they resonate for you? Again, we would love it if you use the YouTube chat function to share a little bit about what you have experienced there. We will be there live with you, responding to that as comments come in. Moving on then to our third and final exercise for the evening. This is normally the biggest part of the Drama Kirk Bible Study evenings, and this is where we improvise scripture. Now, for those who've never joined us for, for these evenings before, when we improvise scripture, we take exactly what the Bible has said. But then, when we come to act it out, you know, it's not that we discover gaps in the Bible. We don't. But we discover but we have to use our imagination to round it out a little bit. 
The example I often give when I'm talking about this is when we stage the Last Supper for the Passion Play at Easter. It doesn't tell you in the Bible what side such and such sits on or when they eat. You have to improvise. You have to think through these things for yourself. So crucially for me, it allows us to draw closer to those important characters in Scripture as we put ourselves in their shoes. And that is what I have asked some of the members of the Drama Kirk team to do on your behalf tonight. So our first improvisation is about what happens immediately after Jesus calls Andrew, Peter, James and John. So in, in three of the four Gospels, Jesus calls these four disciples and then doesn't call any others. He goes back to teaching and healing. Now, there's no mention of a role for those four fishermen in what happens next. But neither does it say they, they stayed at home to pack up, whatever, while Jesus went and taught elsewhere. So I assume, because they're following Jesus by this point, and because we've heard they're wholehearted, I'm coming, that they're there. So I have asked Bill, first of all, to read Luke chapter 15, verses 17 to 20, as the disciple Peter, whom he's very recently played for us in our Passion Play. So Bill will read the text for us, and then I have asked him to improvise as Peter and to share a bit of that experience from his master's feet with you. So I've asked Bill to think about what he's learning, what, his, what he's seeing as Peter, and, and what does it feel to have that early experience as Jesus' right-hand man? Bill. One day, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee, and from Judea and from Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up onto the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Hi, I'm Peter, and I was in that crowded house that day. I marvelled at the power of Jesus to draw people from all walks of life to hear him preach. That day there were people from every walk of life, humble fishermen like me and people who were keen to hear what Jesus had to say and who hung on his every word, wanting to learn, thirsty for knowledge about this new way of life. Then there were the others. The straight-laced, holier-than-thou, we're so much better than everyone else, Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They had come from every village in Galilee and from Judea and from Jerusalem. I couldn't work out why they were there. Were they jealous of the crowds that Jesus attracted? Were they curious about what he might say? Were they hoping to catch him out? I couldn't be sure. What I am sure about is that the house was absolutely bursting to the seams with people. So many people, in fact, and it was so hot, so hot. If you'd fainted, there was no space for you even to hit the ground. I also remember how everyone was focused on what Jesus was saying. So focused, in fact, that we didn't hear people go up onto the roof. We didn't hear people making a gap in the covering on the roof and beginning to lower a man on a mat down through the gap in the roof. In fact, the first I was aware of it was when the man landed so very gently in the tiny space immediately in front of where Jesus was teaching. 
to be honest. I was a bit frightened. I hadn't heard anything and I was taken aback. Jesus didn't even seem surprised. There was then complete silence. The man seemed very, very sick. He wasn't moving. He wasn't speaking. I remember being amazed at the determination of his friends to get him in front of Jesus. And then the silence. No one spoke. I wasn't sure what Jesus would do next. I hoped that he would help the man in some way. And then Jesus said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Well, I did not expect him to say that. I looked around. You could have heard a pin drop. I saw the faces of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They were not happy. Thank you, Bill, for sharing that with us. I wonder if that's something you've thought about before. In those weeks following the calling of the first four disciples, they had that opportunity, potentially, to spend some time with Christ before the other eight disciples were called. Now, usually, if you attend a drama kirk evening like this, when we get to that portion in the evening, you are asked to be part of those improvisations and, and you're not simply watching one person acting out a monologue. I wonder what it would have felt like if you'd been asked to play the person lowered on their mat or potentially asked to play one of the local religious leaders so critical of Jesus. So, moving on to our next improvisation. We're going to look at the calling of Philip and Nathaniel as we read it in John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. Now, Jesus calls Philip, who's from the same fishing village as all of the others, to follow him. Philip, very much like the others before him, has that immediate response to Jesus. He's up for it, he's going to follow. And also, he needs to share that with someone who's important to him. He needs to share it. So he goes and he finds Nathaniel or Bartholomew. And he tells him that he has met the one. But Nathaniel needs a wee bit more convincing. In fact, what Nathaniel needs is his own personal encounter with Jesus before he will believe and then he makes that commitment to follow too. So I have asked Ken to share with us now. He will read those verses that I mentioned for us first. And then Ken is going to provide us with another one of those improvised monologues when we consider why he needed that evidence and what it was about the evidence that Jesus gave him that convinced him that Jesus was indeed the Messiah that they longed for. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, were from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. 
He then added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I'm Nathaniel, sometimes known in certain circles as Bartholomew. I was brought up in Cana in Galilee and I would like to share my experience of meeting the Messiah. Wow, what a mind-blowing introduction that turned out to be. I was sitting under a fig tree. Yes, a fig tree. The fig tree has great significance to Israelis. It's a sacred place of prayer, study and meditation. It's a place of peace, tranquility in the midst of turbulent times. It's a place of longing that the Messiah may show himself as the King of Israel. So when my good friend Philip comes bounding in and tells me that he has met the Messiah, a man called Jesus of Nazareth, I may have sounded a bit sceptical that when I replied, Nazareth, has anything good come from there? He tells me he has met the Messiah and he comes from Nazareth. I'm afraid that just doesn't ring true for me. I have spent many years under the fig tree and I have the reputation of studying our law and in particular Moses' law. And nowhere in our scriptures is Nazareth mentioned. And even when you look at the predictions of our prophets from Genesis to Malachi, there's no mention of Nazareth. In fact, it was Malachi who prophesied that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. So it's difficult for me to comprehend that the Messiah, the Saviour, the Redeemer of Israel, would have anything to do with or come from a place called Nazareth. However, Philip's response was, come and see. He knew me too well. He knew I would find it hard to pass by this invitation. Forgive me if I have dwelled too long on the connotations of the fig tree, but I just have a feeling that maybe just maybe my comments to Philip about Nazareth may just stick with me for a long time to come. As we approached Jesus, he astounded me when he said, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And he couples this that he sees me in a vision under a fig tree. Well, all these messianic prophecies just exploded in front of me and I had no hesitation in acknowledging him as Rabbi, the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus responded by promising me great spiritual insight. I am completely overwhelmed that the teacher knew of my very existence and has invited me to follow him. I am now living the fulfilment of Zechariah's prophecy. How about you? Will you come and see the fulfilment that Jesus promises you? Peace be with you. Thank you, Ken, for sharing that with us. And I hope again that that has perhaps added something to your understanding of those verses. Personally, I, I have always struggled with why the whole fig tree thing convinced him. So thank you, Ken, for helping us to widen our understanding of that. Moving on to our final improvisation then, we're going to look at the calling of Matthew, the tax collector, a man who, of course, would have been very unpopular in his own local setting. So Jesus finds him at work, in his booth, collecting, we can assume. Matthew, again, demonstrates no hesitation whatsoever in following Jesus. He doesn't finish his shift, 
He just goes. And then there's also that initial sharing that we see in so many of these callings. Matthew wants to share things with his friends. But Matthew does it in style. He throws a party for Jesus and he invites his friends. I have now asked Robin if he will read that passage of scripture for us. So Robin is going to read from the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. And then he, as Matthew or Levi, is going to talk to us about why he needed that party and what he might have heard about Jesus from others as he sat in his booth. So over to Robin for our final improvisation of the evening. Thank you. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hello. My name is Levi, though sometimes I am known as Matthew. Although I am a Jew, I am a tax collector for the Romans. And because of this I am hated by my neighbours and the people of our town. But I am also shunned by the people in the temple as being unclean, simply because I work for the Gentiles. But what is a man to do? You have to put food on the table. And being a tax collector does afford a reasonable lifestyle for family. But my life has changed. It happened one day when the man Jesus came to me at my tax booth and told me to follow him. Can you imagine my surprise? One of the unclean, the sinners... How could a man who preaches God's love come and even talk to me? Never mind command me to follow him. That evening when I had invited him to dine with myself and some of my tax collector friends, we were astounded by the way he spoke to us. He didn't treat us as being undeserving. He treated us as he would any other person who was in the kingdom of God. He told us stories of God and how we could find our way into God's kingdom. And you have no idea how important that is for us, who had been denied by the temple authorities, even the opportunity to be part of God's kingdom. I gladly gave up everything I had to follow Jesus. After all, that what he did for me was more meaningful than mere money. I had realised how important it is to be part of God's kingdom, to do good things for other people. No more will I take people's money from them. No more will I work for the Gentiles. God's love and spreading God's love is all that is important. It is time for me to give to others what Jesus so freely gave to me. Thank you for joining us tonight. My thanks to everyone who has contributed, those that you have seen on camera and also those who have helped out behind the scenes and who have made it possible for us to still be able to share one of our Bible study evenings with you. If you've joined us for the first time, then I very much hope that that has been a blessing to you and that we will see you again. I hope that what we've shared tonight has helped us to see a wee bit more about the individual characters in Scripture and what it meant for them to be called by Jesus. And I hope that in some way that will help us to reflect also 
on what he has called us to do. Now, our next online study, we will be looking at the calling of the women who also follow Jesus. But don't worry, we are still very much open for men joining us for that study too. Um, please do keep an eye on social media for any announcements around that. It had initially been scheduled for the 29th of September, but we will keep you posted. Thank you for supporting Drama Kirk this evening. Please do get in touch. Thank you for all of your comments on the YouTube chat. And if you look for us on Facebook or on Twitter, you will find us. Um, our email address is info at dramakirk.org and the website is there for dramakirk.org. So please do get in touch and stay connected with us. May God bless you in how you have been called to serve him. Amen. <laughs>